Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with A Theory is Just a Theory, our series on underdetermination in scientific theory. Today we're going to be looking at the question of are theories falsifiable? And we'll be talking about holistic underdetermination. So before we get started on that, let's talk a little bit about the terms that we're going to be using. So falsifiable. This seems to be, to me, able to be shown or demonstrated to be false through experiment. If you have a different definition of falsifiable, this argument may not apply to you. Please offer it in the comments below. This definition, at least, is commonly used to talk about the claim God exists. And it says the claim God exists is not falsifiable. Therefore, it's not a scientific theory or it can't be tested by science. Now, why is falsifiable important to science or scientific theory? Well, Karl Popper, when talking about the demarcation problem between science and pseudoscience, said that falsifiability is the thing that distinguishes scientific theories from non-scientific theories. Basically, a theory is scientific if and only if it is falsifiable. What we're going to be looking at in this video is not looking at those theories that don't appear to be falsifiable at all, but rather looking at the question of whether or not scientific theories are actually falsifiable. Because if they're not, that would pose a big problem for Popper and his theories of demarcation, and it seems for the methodological practice of science as a whole. Let's take a look. So, the question is, is it possible to take any particular hypothesis and demonstrate that it is false. It would seem so. A physicist, for example, takes a theory that he has, a hypothesis or a theory, and makes a prediction with it. Then he designs some experiment. And if the prediction is not obtained, then the theory is false, is what is implied by the experiment. It seems that if, in fact, the prediction is not obtained, then the theory has been shown to be false. So the theory is falsifiable. But there seems to be a bit of a problem here. Let's take a look more carefully. So we'll represent the theory is true with T. If the theory is true, then the experiment will produce result P. T implies P, basically. The experiment did not produce result P, not P. Therefore, the theory is not true. This seems to be just a classic use of modus tollens. But I think there's something a little bit deeper going on here. Let's look at it logically. The theory is true, assumed indirect proof. Premise 2, T implies P, from our other scientific theories and understandings of the ways experiments work. T implies P. It's not the case that P. We discover this through experiment. Therefore, it's not the case that T, 3, 4, modus tollens, T and not T, 1, 4, conjunction. Therefore, using our indirect proof, 1 through 5, we can conclude not T. The problem here is that it seems that not T is not our only possible conclusion. We could instead deny premise 2 and say it's not the case that T implies P, basically saying that our other scientific theories are less important, or there's some one specific scientific theory in there that we can throw out and hold on to T, because we like T better. It seems that the information we have right now underdetermines which conclusion we should draw. We don't know if we should draw conclusion premise 6 or premise 6 star. Either of them are viable, because we've assumed both that T is true and that our other scientific theories are true, and that T implies P. But there's no way for us to tell which of those assumptions we should throw out because we've now reached a contradiction. Let's put this into a more specific context and talk about Newton's celestial mechanics. So, Newton's celestial mechanics is a theory about the motion of the planets. We're going to take that as our T, our theory. If Newton's celestial mechanics is correct, then the orbits of the planets will be correctly predicted. T implies P. Newton's celestial mechanics does not correctly predict the advance of the perihelion in Mercury's orbit, not P. Therefore, Newton's celestial mechanics is false. Once again, this seems to be a classical standard use of modus tollens. The problem is that we could also come up with another conclusion. 
Therefore, there exists another planet, Vulcan, closer to the sun that is affecting Mercury's orbit. And in fact, that was the conclusion that was drawn by many scientists at the time. Instead of denying the original theory, they denied one of their assumptions or one of their other theories that caused them to reach the conclusion that T implies P. They said that it's possible for Newton's celestial mechanics to be correct, but that it not predict the orbit of the planets correctly. Why? Because we don't have the right information about what planets exist. Basically, the evidence that we have underdetermines the conclusion. All that has been shown is that one of the theories that we accept is incorrect. But since we can't test one without all of the others, there's no way to tell which theory is incorrect. Now, before you start typing in the comments, there might be a response to this that would go something like this. What if we searched for Vulcan, and upon not finding it, gave up on Newton's theories? We could do that, right? Now, imagine then that we've searched exhaustively and not found Vulcan. Therefore, we can conclude that Newton's celestial mechanics is false, right? I'm not so sure. Maybe we could instead conclude that therefore Vulcan is made of some kind of, let's call it, dark matter that we are unable to perceive, but has mass and affects orbits. Because we want to hold on to our theory, we're going to posit something else that will explain the theory, that will get rid of maybe some of the other theories that we have, that anything that has mass can be perceived by us, and throw in another theory in there to make our original theory of Newton's celestial mechanics consistent with the information that we're getting from the world. Once again, we're underdetermined as to which of these conclusions we should draw. I'm going to break it down into a premise conclusion form to really show that this is a problem. Premise 1. A theory is falsifiable if and only if its tested falsehood is not dependent on the truth of other theories. Premise 2. If a theory cannot be tested in isolation, then its tested falsehood is dependent on the truth of other theories. Premise 3, no theory can be tested in isolation. Therefore, for all theories, their tested falsehood is dependent on the truth of other theories. Therefore, no theory is falsifiable. To look at this argument, I'm first going to show that if premises 1, 2, and 3 are true, then the conclusion follows. I'll show that it's valid in that way. And then we'll offer some defense justification or understanding of why one might accept premises 1, 2, and 3. Let's take a look. So, in order to put this into some formal standards, we're going to do it like this. A theory is falsifiable is fx. A theory x is falsifiable, fx. The falsehood of a theory x is dependent on the truth of some other theory y. We're going to have that as a relation, dxy. And a theory x can be tested in isolation. We're going to represent with ix. With that understood, we can put this into a nice symbolic form. Premise 1 for all x. If x is falsifiable, that's materially equivalent to it's not the case that there exists some y such that the falsehood of x is dependent on the truth of y. For all x, it's not the case that x can be tested in isolation implies that there exists some y such that x's falsehood is not dependent on the truth of y. And finally, premise 3, for all x, it's not the case that x can be tested in isolation. And what we're going to try to conclude is, for all x, it's not the case that x is falsifiable. Let's take a look. So first off, we're going to take premise 3 and we're going to do universal instantiation on it. That's going to be, it's not the case that z is an i. Then we're going to take premise 2 and do universal instantiation on it. It's not the case that z is an i implies there exists some y such that z bears relation d to y. Then we'll go ahead and use modus ponens on those last two premises to get there exists a y such that z bears relation d to y. Next up, we're going to do universal instantiation on premise 1 to get z is an f is materially equivalent to it's not the case that there exists some y such that z bears relation d to y. Then we're going to expand that equivalent statement into its two parts, its two conditionals. Z is an F implies it's not the case there exists some Y such that Z bears relation D to Y, and it's not the case there exists a Y such that Z bears relation D to Y implies that Z is an F. It's just our definition of equivalence. 
We simplify that down to z is an f implies it's not the case there exists some y such that z bears relation d to y, simplification of 8. Then with modus tollens and premise 6, 9, we conclude it's not the case that z is an f. We can go from that using universal generalization to get for all x, it's not the case that x is an f. Premise 10, universal generalization, or for all theories, x. It's not the case that x is falsifiable. So, now that we've shown that this is a valid argument, let's see if it's sound. I'm going to offer a little bit of justification for the premises. Let's take a look. So, our first premise, a theory is falsifiable if and only if its tested falsehood is not dependent on the truth of other theories. Well, let's imagine the opposite to kind of justify this premise. Imagine there exists some theory that is falsifiable, but can only be shown to be false when other theories are assumed to be true. This seems problematic, because if those theories do turn out to be false, because we've only assumed them be, to be true, our original theory can't be shown to be false, and in fact is not falsifiable. So without those other theories, there's no way for it to be falsifiable. So we don't really know if it's falsifiable or not, because we've already assumed other theories into the mix. If that didn't make sense, let's look at a concrete example. So, imagine that someone claimed that God does not exist is falsifiable. That's a falsifiable claim. They say that if we assume the theory that the Bible is true as our framework, and then test the theory by looking at the Bible, we falsified it. Because it's falsified in comparison to our other theories. Yet the only reason that this is going to work is that we allowed for its tested falsehood to be dependent on our other theories. We can't allow that to happen, otherwise a lot of theories that we wouldn't want to be considered scientific are going to have to be considered scientific. So it would be really problematic for a theory to be falsifiable and not have its tested falsehood be not dependent on the truth of other theories. Conversely, let's imagine some theory whose falsehood we have shown without depending on any other theories. There exists some theory out there that is falsifiable without any other theories showing it one way or another. Unless the theory is self-contradictory, then it can only be shown to be false if it disagrees with some other theory or belief that we possess, or piece of evidence that we have. You have to have some not T to compare with the original assumption of T. Now, we are now setting aside self-contradictory theories. Perhaps a better premise one would be, if a theory is not self-contradictory, a theory is falsifiable if and only if its tested falsehood is not dependent on the truth of other theories. But the problem is, if science is only able to deal with self-contradictory theories, it seems that science has turned into logic, and not a very good version of logic at that. So it seems that this premise has to go both ways. If you have examples of ways that it doesn't, I would love to see them in the comments below. Next up, premise two. If a theory cannot be tested in isolation, then its tested falsehood is dependent on the truth of other theories. To me, this just seems to be an understanding of our definitions and mixing of words going on, but perhaps you disagree. Basically, imagine the opposite, that there exists some theory that cannot be tested in isolation, but depends on no other theories for its falsification. Or, in other words, it must be tested using other theories, and yet no other theories are used in its testing for falsification. It seems that that's just a complete contradiction. But perhaps you have another understanding of what those words mean. Once again, offer them in the comments below. And finally, no theory can be tested in isolation. Once again, putting aside self-contradictory theories, any experiment that we design or argument that we craft is dependent on our beliefs and previous theories. In order to get the claim that a particular theory will be confirmed or denied by a particular experiment, we require some justification. The only place this justification can come from is our existing belief structure. The only way we can justify that premise of T implies P is by using our existing belief structure and our existing theories. And those theories are just as much in question as the original theory that we brought to the table to test. So the problem is when we get a contradiction, we don't know if we can deny our original theory or if we should rather deny those pre-existing conceptions and other theories that underline our base understanding of the way that the world works. We don't know which we should get rid of. Therefore, no theory is falsifiable. 
We've shown that the argument is valid, and I've defended the premises. I truly would appreciate any feedback you have on the premises. If you think there's a problem there, please offer it. I would love for science to work, but it seems to me that it doesn't. Because, by Popper, if no theory is falsifiable, no theory is scientific. Or, as Quine says, the unit of empirical significance is the whole of science. Basically, we can only test all of our hypotheses at once. If we find a problem, we cannot know where that problem is. That was Our Theories Falsifiable, the problem of holistic underdetermination. Next up, we are going to be looking at another important question, Is Science Rational? with Larry Loudon, the SSK. Then, Are Theories Verifiable? Contrastive Underdetermination. And finally, Are Our Theories Correct? Transient Underdetermination. Watch this video and more at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.